Uh, I am an atheist. I was a true Muslim, but then... I believe that a chain of coincidences created man. I was not a so-called Muslim like today's Muslims. I was praying, I read the Quran, I learned to read the Quran in Arabic. I definitely don't have a tight perspective, I'm not narrow-minded. If someone gives me rational explanations and satisfying answers to my questions, I can return to religious belief again. What are you doing? Are you studying at MeToo too? Yes, I'm studying psychology at MeToo. Our topic today is beliefs. Can you tell me a little about yours? Well, I am an atheist, but till two to three years ago, I was a Muslim. I was not a so-called Muslim like today's Muslims. I was praying, I read the Quran, I learned to read the Quran in Arabic, I read the translation of the Quran, I was fasting, so I was a Muslim. A true Muslim. But after doing research, I realized some things that didn't sit well with me and started not to believe. I also came across your videos with atheists. They said they didn't believe, but couldn't defend their opinion. I don't know. Maybe young people look at atheism differently. And most become atheists without any research or knowledge. So they can't defend their beliefs. They seemed wrong about being atheists because they weren't able to say what was necessary. It's like they became atheists to look cool or something. You're saying we talked to uninformed atheists? Yes, I think they were uninformed. So can you say you're knowledgeable? I did my own research. I mean, I tried to answer the questions that bugged me. And I definitely don't have a tight perspective. I'm not narrow-minded. If I presented my questions to someone and he gave explanations that make sense, why wouldn't I believe again? As far as I understand, you want to have proof and proceed rationally. Well, can you give me one piece of evidence for the non-existence of God or a sign of non-existence? I can't definitely say that there is no creator. Actually, I'm a bit agnostic towards God, but I definitely think that religions don't exist. Then let's look at the creator first. When knowledge is available, obscurity is removed. For example, if I were to ask how many students are in this university, you'd say I don't know. If we find an evidence, a feature or a document is given to us on paper, there will be no unknown aspect, right? Yes. If I were to give you the proof for the existence of the Creator, offer you rational, logical, and clear evidence, could we close this topic of the unknown? I can't do that right away. I need to research first, but... I will give you evidence. Okay, I'm listening. If the evidence makes sense, you can decide right now. Yes, tell me. Let's say we're in front of the Selimia Mosque. I'll give you one material and one concrete example. We're in front of the Selimia Mosque and we're trying to find out a logical answer to how it was built. We have four basic options before us. Firstly, we can either say that it is a group of people who are deaf, blind, and unintelligent next to this mosque and that they built this mosque by mutual agreement. Or secondly, the bricks of the mosque agreed among themselves and said, what are we waiting for? Let's build a mosque. I'd say that the bricks built this mosque by themselves. Or the third option, I see the architectural project manual inside the mosque describing the construction stages and I say that this manual built the mosque. Or the fourth option, there's an architect like Mimir Sinan. I say that an architect, a genius like Mimir Sinan, built this mosque with his knowledge, will and might. Which of these options would you choose? I'd definitely choose Mimir Sinan. Okay, but every human being is structured, more complex and orderly compared to a mosque. Am I right? Humans, yes. When I look at human beings rationally and logically, I need to ask the same question. I look at human beings, and a human has roughly 100 trillion cells. And inside each cell, there are 800 organelles named mitochondria, and there are 10,000 particles named ribosomes. Each cell progresses systematically with an incredible structure. According to biology professor Michael Denton, each cell is a city like New York. How many cells do we have in our body? There are 100 trillion New York cells. When I look at such a complex structure, I need to find a rational answer for how it's done. The cells and bodies of human beings are not built once and left like a mosque. Isn't our body regenerating all the time? Yes, it is. Every second, 10,000 red blood cells are created and 50 million cells are refreshed. And in our brains, aren't there 10 to 16 processes happening every second? There are. I've looked at this complex structure and I'm going to ask the same rational question. I still have four options to find out how a human being is built daily. One, I will say that these deaf, blind and unintelligent nature events made human beings in mutual agreement. But this is illogical. Why? Because how will blind, deaf and unintelligent events come to an agreement and choose to continuously make human beings? Earlier we said that if a mosque can't be built like this, neither can humans, right? The things you mentioned can't. The second option. The atoms that form and create the human body in between themselves. They must have said, what are we waiting for? Let's create this human being. 
and they continued to do it all the time. The mind would not accept this either. Why? As we said, bricks could not get together to form a mosque. Then I'll say that lifeless atoms cannot agree between themselves to form this human being. We initially accept this anyway. Or the third option, we said that the project manual of the mosque could not create the mosque because it is a book. Similarly, I'd say that DNA cannot create a human being because DNA is the book, not the author. Then I'll say that the DNA can't be the phenomenon that forms a human being, just like the manual. Or the fourth option, we'll say yes, there is an architect in the fourth option who is creating the human moment by moment, continuing to create as he did in the beginning. There is a knowledgeable entity who can make choices and has a will, power, and life. Just as Mimar Sinan built that mosque, the creator of the universe created man. And I'd say he's the architect who continues to make all the time. Then I will ask you this again. As we accept the architect, similarly, shouldn't we accept that the creator of the universe created humans? He who created not only but millions and trillions of people from the beginning of the world, shouldn't we accept an architect of the constant creation, programming, and refreshing of humans? Uh, not necessarily. I think these events take place due to a particular coincidence. I think that a chain of coincidences created human beings. Hence, I disagree with the idea that human beings must have a creator. Five people per second, 350,000 people a day. Put the humans aside, all living beings, maybe millions of living beings are created every day. I'm asking, who do you attribute the construction ability to, which is constantly going on? Who is the entity doing this all the time? My DNA does that. But look, we said in the first example, the manual cannot make the building. We said that an architect would make the building according to the plan. Similarly, DNA cannot do the construction. We must say that the architect arranges and creates humans according to the DNA book. You also didn't accept this in the first place. Yes, DNA does not do this. The DNA does not create the human. There is DNA in each of our cells, in our core. For instance, the DNA of the heart muscle cell tells it to beat in a certain way, and it does. What is the evidence for this? What is the evidence that it gives instructions? Because DNA is the book. There is no power to command within itself. DNA is just a system loaded with information. You may have learned this in biology classes. But after all, our cell takes it and uses it. No, not using. Who makes it use? There is a formation process. But who is doing this? I'm asking you about the one with this characteristic. You say it's not DNA, then who? Okay, let's say we got together somehow. Uh, do we need a creator to get together like this? I'm trying to say this. A creator doesn't have to regenerate it. You can't leave this attribute unanswered. You have to say, yeah, okay, if DNA cannot, then who? I say, okay, let's talk about it. I already gave you the attributes. An attribute can't be left hanging. Let's settle this first. We'd say that there must be someone with these attributes. Without knowledge, one cannot do this. They must have knowledge. Those who do not have a will cannot make decisions and obviously cannot do this. It must have the power. In other words, its power must be continuous and it must have a life. Because we'd say that a lifeless matter cannot do this process, and someone without these qualities, these attributes, cannot create the human being. And look, I'm just giving the example of a human. I say that it cannot make a human being and cannot continue to do so, because there has to be someone with this attribute. I'm looking at nature. Is it lifeless? It is lifeless. Does it have knowledge? No. It is blind, deaf, and unintelligent. Remember the first example again? We said that this cannot make a mosque. I like to ask who is the responsible of this event, the event that I encounter every day. If it's not DNA, it cannot be left unanswered either. There has to be someone. You can say, let's leave it as X for the moment. Let's put a question mark. But there has to be a person with four attributes, an entity who exists. We said that three of the four options are impossible. We came to this conclusion together. Only one option necessarily remains. Okay, let's just admit it. Let's say humans have to be created. Okay, should it necessarily be a god as Muslims describe? For example, babies. A baby dies, what happens to that baby? He's sinless. He goes to heaven. So what's the difference between a sinless baby going to heaven and my teacher giving me an A because there isn't any exam paper left? After all, we have to complete this test. We will either pass or fail. So a candidate comes to the exam room and they say, there's no exam paper left for you. Your exam is over and they pass directly. Do you think this is fair? What is justice? We need to talk about it first. Because in order to talk about justice, we have to give something in return. For example, you went to buy a phone, okay? You bought a phone from a store. If the phone turns out to be broken, you can go to customer service or court because you gave money for it, right? Yes. Why? Because you gave something in return. But let's say a man came here and saw we were chatting. He said, what a nice conversation you guys are having. Then he gave you two cars as a gift. Then he gave me five villas. Can you say, hey, brother, what's the matter? How come you gave me two cars but gave him five villas? This isn't fair. I will go to court and complain. What would the judge say to you? 
Like this, humans too cannot object at some point because humans do not give anything in return. But he was bound to be blessed on earth with the blessings he received as a gift and eventually go to heaven. Then we'll say that since I did not give anything in return, the notion of justice is not applicable here. If you ask, then why is he going to heaven? I'm at risk. I ask you, brother, take off your coat and wear it inside out. And if I say, you're going to change the color of this coat, would you accept it? Would it make sense? No. Why? Because the coat is yours. The owner has the rights he wishes on it. Likewise, the earth, paradise, and the hereafter are properties of God. The owner has the rights he wishes on the properties. For example, he can create a plant directly on earth or directly plant it in heaven. How can we object? No. Why not? There is a rose here. He can plant a rose there too, just like the baby. Think of a baby rose, for example. He can bring the baby directly here and after showing it to people and making it happy, he can take that rose directly to heaven. I can't object here. Why? Because it doesn't concern me. Because God says in the verse, we said that we will talk about Islam. God says in Surah Maryam, and he will come to us alone, alone. So individually, in other words, everyone will be questioned individually. For example, whatever the trait you're given, God will ask you about it. He will ask me about what he gave me. Likewise, our actions make us responsible for the traits given to us individually. And so is the baby. Whether the baby comes here or not, or goes directly to heaven, it doesn't affect my justice. And we say that God created humans individually. Whatever he has given individually, he wants it back fairly. It means that we should evaluate it among these notions and think about the notion of justice in this way. Let's say something in Islam does not seem rational to us. The fact that something is not rational for us cannot be proof that it's wrong. Why? Let's say we live in the era of Mehmed the Conqueror, okay? During the reign of Mehmed the Conqueror, there were Tughras everywhere, Ottoman signatures, and he issues an order saying, no one will leave their house for five years. Does this make sense? No. It doesn't make sense. Can I be irrational and say, there is no Mehmed the Conqueror? Can we come to such a conclusion? No, we, we can't. can't. Can I say for the second example, there are Ottoman Tughras everywhere. This seems like an irrational rule to me. Then can I say that there is no Ottoman region? I can't. Why? There are Tughras everywhere. It will cause us to ask, why did Mehmed the Conqueror do such a thing? Why did he bring such a rule during his reign? We'd question it. Similar to the example, God brought down rules with Islam. If you say, this example in Islam does not make sense to me, a conclusion such as, if there is such a rule, there is no God, can't be taken. The fact that I don't like a rule given by God is not a proof of the wrongness of Islam, which is its set of rules. Why? Because there are Tughras everywhere. For example, there is a verse in Surah Rum that talks about the future. It says, the Byzantines have been defeated in the nearest land, but they after their defeat will overcome. While everyone thinks that they'll lose, the Greeks come victorious afterwards by defeating the Persians. It's a verse that talks about the future, about the event that will come exactly nine years after it. And I'll say that this is a Tughra for me. How can a human being foretell the future? Since a human cannot foretell the future, the owner of this Torah would be the owner of Islam. This means that the rules that seem illogical to me are not evidence for the wrongdoings of Islam, nor can they be evidence for the wrongdoing of God. Well then, wouldn't it be more logical to open the door from inside? By accepting Islam, look for answers for questions from within Islam? I mean, I think these are things to consider. It's not something to decide quickly with the human intellect. You say you will think about them? Yes, I've always thought about religious matters and I will continue to think. The work you're doing has shifted and diversified my thoughts. It steered me in some direction. I will think and analyze it in different ways. This made me happy. 